Hey guys, it's Chris from Highland Guitars and you're watching another episode of From the Luthier's Workbench. In this episode, I'm gonna pick up where I left off in the last episode, which was part three of my building the Highline Guitars bass guitar. And what I'm gonna talk about specifically in this episode is I'm going to do a little bit of cleanup work on this neck, and then I'm going to install the truss rod, glue on the fretboard, and then I'm gonna make and install some fret marker dots, and then I'll finish by doing a little bit of cleanup work on the heel in order to get the neck to fit into the body the way I want it to fit in. So uh, let's jump in and get started. After liberating the neck from the blank, I still had the tab remnants to deal with. So I grabbed a Iwasaka file and filed off the little nubs that remained. I want to make sure that the surface where I'm going to glue the fretboard is as flat as possible. So I sanded it on some 80 grit sandpaper that was clamped to a flat surface. Next I installed a uh, 20 inch long two-way truss rod and then I began applying uh, tight bond original wood glue to the surface. And uh, some people like to use a strip of masking tape over the top of the truss rod while they apply the glue. but uh, I'm fairly careful at spreading the glue around so I'm not too concerned about masking off the truss rod. And then once I have a uh, consistent bead of glue on the surface where I'm going to be gluing on the fretboard, I need to spread it around. And to do that, I'm just going to use an old credit card. And since wood glue is really slippery, I like to put a very small pinch of salt in a couple of spots where I've spread out that glue. And since salt is a mineral, what it will do is it will help grab the fretboard and keep it from sliding around later on as I start to apply clamping pressure. Now with type on wood glue, I, I have about uh, five to 10 minutes of working time before it starts to set up to the point where I can't move the fretboard. So I need to make sure uh, within that time frame that I have the fretboard positioned correctly on the neck. And as I'm doing this, I'll just hold it temporarily into position with some squeeze clamps. And then once I'm satisfied the fretboard is positioned correctly, I can start uh, clamping it into place with um, stronger C clamps. To assist in the final clamping of the fretboard, I like to use, it's a, a call that I made, and it's made from a piece of plywood cut to the same shape as the fretboard with two maple strips glued along the outside edge. And what this does it is it allows me to uh, focus the clamping pressure from the center of the fretboard out to the edges. And as I apply the clamps and tighten them, what I'm looking for is consistent squeeze out of the glue along both sides of the fretboard. And when you see consistent squeeze out, you know you've got um, the uh, correct amount of glue and uh, the right amount of clamping pressure. If there's any gaps, then you probably need uh, a little bit more glue in that area or a little bit more clamping pressure. So the key is to see consistent squeeze out along that edge, as you can see here. And don't be tempted to grab a damp rag and wipe off that squeeze out because all you're gonna do is press some of the glue into the wood fibers, which can affect the way uh, finish will absorb into the wood later on. So I'll show you how I deal with that later. Now, while that fretboard is drying, um, what I'm gonna do now is make my fretboard marker dots. And the way I do that is I use a quarter inch diameter plug cutting bit in my drill press. And I just drill uh, the appropriate number of um, marker dots uh, out of a piece of scrap ebony. 
after drilling the plugs, they're still going to be attached to the ebony. So to remove them without damaging them, I'll put a piece of duct tape over the top and then run that strip through my bandsaw. And then all I have to do is peel off that tape and presto, I have my marker dots. After the glue for the fretboard had dried, I grabbed one of my half-round Japanese Iwasaka files and used it to uh, scrape off the glue squeeze-out that had formed along the edges of the fretboard. And then gluing in those ebony fret marker dots is just a matter of filling the holes in the fretboard with a little bit of CA glue and then pressing those dots into position. And then to do the side marker dots, the first thing I had to do was mark uh, a line uh, which would serve as a center line for each of the dots that runs the length of the fretboard. And then I could mark the exact position of each of those marker dots as it corresponds to the dot on the top surface. Now, as you can see, I'm doing this all by hand, and uh, that's because I've been doing this for a lot of years. If you've never done this before, I highly recommend that you grab a ruler and a set of calipers to make sure that you have those um, side markers positioned um, consistently along that edge. And then I use a center punch uh, to put a, um, a dent in the wood that my drill bit will um, dive into as I drill the side marker dot holes. And for this guitar, I'm using a 3 seconds inch diameter bit and then just drilling it roughly about an eighth of an inch deep. And whenever I'm sanding ebony, I like to keep uh, some of the dust in a container because ebony dust is like gold. And what I'll do is I'll press some of that dust down into the holes that I just drilled on the side of the fretboard. And then once those holes are filled, I can go back in with some water-thin CA glue and apply just a single drop to each dot. Now, as you can see, the marker dots that I glued into the top of the fretboard are sitting way too proud. They're about a quarter of an inch up out of the fretboard. So I grabbed a one of my little um, fret saws and just sliced off the top of the uh, plug so that it would be easier to sand down flush with the fretboard in a few minutes. Now what I plan to do in one operation is to sand down those marker dots and at the same time, I want to fine tune the radius of the fretboard to make sure that it is consistent from side to side and from end to end. So I'll use a straight edge to check and make sure that the fretboard is straight. And if not, I'll adjust the truss rod. Uh, but in this case, ideally, what you want to do is um, start with the truss rod in the neutral position. And then I'll check the radius. And then using a long radius sanding beam, I'll just begin to gradually sand 
the entire surface of the fretboard and periodically I'll switch the neck around to cancel out any error in my sanding stroke. For the sanding operation I'm using a strip of 240 grit sandpaper and once I'm satisfied that the radius is consistent from side to side and end to end later on I can switch to finer grit sandpaper and not really have to worry about changing the shape of the radius. The marker dots on the side also have to be sanded flush and here I'm just using a small rubber eraser wrapped with some 220 grit to bring those dots down flush with the edge of the fretboard. Now if you're an astute observer you might have noticed that my neck heel has sharp corners whereas the neck pocket in the body has rounded corners and I could either round the corner of the neck heel or I can just grab a chisel and chisel out that rounded shape in the corners of the neck pocket which is my preferred method of, of matching the neck to the body. And this is one of those operations that highlights the fact that even when you're using a CNC machine to make a guitar, there's still quite a bit of handwork that needs to be done to complete it. Now another issue that came up with this build in particular is that after I had finished making the neck, I decided to kind of reshape the... Uh, front of the guitar body where the cutouts are and what I did was I just um, changed the shape enough to where once the neck was installed into the into the pocket the uh, the heel of the neck and that front uh, rounded portion of the neck pocket isn't going to line up correctly so what I'm going to need to do is do some reshaping of the neck heel in order for them to line up the way I want them to. And uh, to, to do all this, I need to finally get the neck to fit into the pocket all the way, as you can see here. But then what I had to do was um, draw a line, which you can see on the heel here, that indicates where the body uh, heel of the neck pocket uh, fits to the neck. And then I grabbed my half round Iwasaka files and just started carving away that little bit of neck heel in order to get those two parts to line up. This is part of the neck fitting process. I don't always have to do it, but if I've messed with the, uh, the design of the body after making the neck, I can pretty well count on having to do this. But once I had finished carving um, the shape of that heel right to that line, I could then grab um, one of my little rubber erasers uh, wrapped with some 220 grit sandpaper and then sand that transition and get it really smooth with the rest of the neck contour. And with a little bit of shaping, you can see how nicely the neck transitions into the body. Well, unfortunately, that's all the time I got for this episode of From the Luthier's Workbench. In the next episode, I'm going to be covering part five of the bass guitar build, which will involve uh, continuing uh, with this uh, bass guitar neck. And what I'm going to be doing in the next episode is a bunch of sanding to get it ready for finish. I'm then going to apply my Highline logo to the front of the headstock, and then uh, I will be installing the fret wires. So until the next episode, uh, I hope that you find this uh, whole series to be informative and maybe inspirational. Uh, be sure to give me a thumbs up, you know, and then of course, if you don't uh, already subscribe to the Highline Guitars YouTube channel, hit that subscribe button down below and click the bell notification next to it so that you get notified each time I post a new video, which is about once a week. So until the next episode, I hope you have a great weekend and a great week ahead. See you soon.